Income Tax 2021-2022 Income Tax Formula Get ready to get refunds to the max. Diving into Income Tax 2021-2022 We're going to start looking at the tax formula in OneNote. If you have access to OneNote, you could follow along. If not, that's okay too. Later on, we're going to be looking at the formula with the use of Excel. Typically in practice, I'll use something like this so that I can double check what has been input into the system, into the tax software with an outside, possibly more transparent worksheet in Excel. So we'll take a look at that in future presentations. You also might wanna have a form 1040, which you could find on the IRS website, irs.gov. So you can compare the formula to the 1040. Here's our 1040 in our tax software with our mock client, that being Adam Smith, living in Beverly Hills, 90210. And you can kind of compare the information down below and you can see you have a, basically an extended format of the tax formula. Tax software will also often have a tax summary kind of page, which will give you the information in more of a formula basis as well. We'll take a look at that more in a future presentation. So let's go back on over to OneNote. Note, and the first thing you want to think about is and understand is the income tax is a tax on income. That means the first part of the tax formula is going to be some kind of income statement, a standard income statement you would think of as income minus expenses. That would mean that any natural deduction that you would expect would be deductible would be something that you had to use or expend in order to generate income. So a natural kind of way that you would think about an income tax is that you would say, I've got my income is gonna be on the top line item. And then what kind of deductions would naturally be appropriate for an income tax? Normally you would think of the type of deductions that you needed to expend in order to generate revenue would be the type of expenses that would be natural to an income tax so that the income tax is not being uh, given on the gross income, the top line, but actually on the net income, the income that you had after having to expend the expenses in order to generate income. Obviously the tax code is gonna deviate from that a lot because the tax code is not just there for revenue generation, it's also basically used to influence us in some ways. So when you th start to think about the things that are deductible, you're, you're gonna to start to say, hey, wait a sec, that's not like uh, something that is used in order to generate income. It's got some other purpose, aim or goal, which is the reason the legislation has been put into place, which makes the income statement in the income tax a little confusing, not a standard kind of income statement, but that's the first starting point you want to think about. We're doing an income tax. We're going to get taxed on basically the bottom line of the taxable income statement that will start off with income, which we can think about as gross income. Now we're going to dive into more detail of each of these line items in the formula. When we look at the top line, which we would typically think of as gross income in an income statement, that's even going to be a bit more confusing because it's going to include things which we could think of as gross in income like W-2 wages, but it will also include things that are from our sole proprietorship that could be reported like on a Schedule C. And the Schedule C will have a, an income statement for the business, which we would imagine more of a common income statement with the gross income minus all the deductions, which in that case are expenses that are used in order to generate the revenue. The net income is going to pull into the first page of the 1040 and be in this first income line item. So this formula, again, is is a simplified formula that we can kind of hold in our mind we're going to have to expand on it to think about what kinds of things are going to fit into these particular line items and how much detail we got to think about uh, in order to think about different changes that are going to happen such as what if someone has a schedule c business and so on and so forth and deductions and income related to it so then we're going to have the uh, deduction or subtraction of and you can think about these as deductions there's typically two you want to think in your mind two major categories of deductions for the individual income tax return. We are in essence mirroring here the form 1040. We have what we could call, they're sometimes called above the line deductions. Uh, and sometimes they're gonna, they could be called a schedule one deduction now because there's been changes and they're on a different schedule at this point in time. And they could be called adjustments to income. So these are kind of the above the line or adjustments to income as opposed to the standard deduction or the itemized deductions. That's gonna give you the adjusted gross income, the AGI. Now this above the line deductions, there's not as many of them. So we'll be, we'll be able to kind of, we'll go through those, we'll expand on what those deductions are. But those, if you can get those deductions, 
those have a benefit over the itemized deductions, which are possibly the more common deductions that used to that usually come to mind when we're thinking about deductions, because these adjustments to income or above the line deductions or schedule one deductions are not subject to the same kind of either or requirement that we will see in the itemized deductions. In other words, I don't have to clear some kind of hurdle like the standard deduction in order to take them. Or in other words, I can take the standard deduction and still be able to take the adjustments to income in general. They're not linked to whether or not I take a standard deduction or whether I am itemizing. This subtotal is just going to be a subtotal on the way down to the bottom of the income statement, similar to like a multiple step income statement to get down to a nor in a normal income statement terms and down to net income, in this case, to taxable income. But this number is going to be really important, the adjusted gross income or AGI. The reason it's really important is because a lot of times when you're thinking about credits or when you're thinking about deductions, they have a phase out characteristic. In other words, the tax code is often going to say if your income goes above a certain level, we're going to start to phase out the benefits that you get from certain deductions and credits. And they're typically not going to be basing it on the top line, the income. They're at least going to start out basing it on the AGI. So when we say there's an income limitation, usually more technically, it would be an adjusted gross income based in, uh, limitation, not on the top line. They could be pretty closely related depending on how many adjustments to income uh, there might have. So that's a good key number to keep in mind. And then we're going to be subtracting either the standard deduction and the itemized de or the itemized deduction. Here's where the confusion mostly comes in with people because the standard deduction is, is a deduction that will be will be standardized and it'll be based on, in essence, your filing uh, status and a couple other conditions that we'll talk about later. So we'll get into the dollar amounts of the standard deduction. But the general idea is you're going to have one standard deduction or one set of standard deductions based on your conditions. And uh, and that'll be it. Or if you have itemized deductions that are over a certain amount, you can take the itemized deductions. So the itemized deductions include those types of deductions that often come to mind when we think about deductions, like the charitable deduction. There's there's, there's an above the line component, so so it gets a little bit more tricky. But you know most of the time, the most of the charitable deductions are on the itemized deductions. When you think about deductions related to interest and taxes or mortgage taxes, I'm sorry, mortgage interest and property taxes, for example, those are going to be the itemized deductions. And so when you're thinking about you know, what's going to be the impact on your taxes, you've got to think about the interplay between these two items. Now, note, there's often an argument within t the tax law saying, I mean, should we simplify the tax code by lessening the amount of deductions, possibly giving a greater standard deduction versus having the itemized deduction? So when they try to simplify the law, they're often saying, OK, what we're going to do is try to increase the standard deduction so that everybody just has a standard deduction and we're not going to get into all this itemized deduction business. You'll note that the itemized deductions include a lot of items that once again, they're not those kind of things that you would think would be natural to uh, an income tax because you would think the things that would be deductible would be those expenses that you need to expend in order to generate revenue. And oftentimes when we look at the deductions that here, such as a personal residence, you know, mortgage interest deduction and the property taxes and whatnot, those are on personal things. So you would think there's some other driving factor or incentive as to why they became deductible other than what would be natural to an income tax. So oftentimes you'll hear arguments on the income tax code saying, well, we should simplify the tax code versus we should in increase the itemized deductions, having them give them more influence so that we can do things with the tax code and influence people's behavior through the tax code. Those are often going to be, you know, two angles that people think about with tax policy. Do we want to use the tax code to influence people? Well, that's usually going to mean that it's going to be a more complex tax code. And that would mean people would probably be favoring more power to the itemized deductions so that they can use those to, you know, uh, drive people to do this, that, or the other thing based on tax influences. If you're trying to simplify the tax code, then you're probably saying, well, now I want to lessen the role of the itemized deductions and just have a standard deduction. Also, the itemized deductions probably, of course, favor more well-off individuals because you're more likely to be itemizing if, if you're more well-off. Generally, you're going to have more deductions that are going to be over the standard. So the general rule then would be 
You're gonna take the standard deduction. If it's greater than the itemized deduction, you would only be taking the itemized deductions if they were greater than the standard deduction because you want the maximum benefit for taxes. Benefit for taxes mean that the expenses, which are in essence the deductions, are good. Everything's flipped on its head for taxes. So, and that's a key component. Remember when you're on the, when you're on your business side of things, if you were trying to get a loan, for example, for your business or something like that, and you're going to the bank, you're trying to look good. You're in your best suit, you got, right? You've got your income statement. You're trying to say, this is how much I'm making. And you're trying to say, I make enough money to pay back the loan. Give me a loan, please. When you're talking about taxes, everything is flipped on its head. You're trying to look bad. You're, you can imagine visiting the tax person with holes in your jeans and so forth. You're not actually gonna do that, but that would be more of the, <laughs> right? I don't have any money, right? I, the expenses are good. The income, the income is bad <laughs> for taxes because it's an income tax. So that means what we wanna do is take the, the biggest amount of deductions we can, which would basically be kind of like expenses if you're thinking about a normal type of income statement. So we would only take in the itemized deductions if they're greater than the standard deduction. That means that when you're thinking about itemized deductions, you gotta think about, is it worthwhile for me to collect a bunch of the itemized deductions? Things like medical expenses and so forth can get quite tedious to, to be collecting the data on if, I don't, if I'm not gonna be able to get a benefit from them. So we'll break down some of those itemized uh, expenses when we get into that section of the course. Then the next line is gonna be the taxable income. So you kind of think about this as the bottom line of the income statement portion of the tax formula. We're not done yet because we have to calculate the taxes. And then we also have the more, the complexities of the credits, which are different than the deductions. And then we also have the fact that we already made payments on it. So we're really only halfway to the end of the actual calculation here. But this is, this is the part that you kind of are, are verifying oftentimes when you're filling out the 1040 to see what your taxable income will be. This would be kind of equivalent to the net income if you thought about just a normal income statement, basically income, gross income minus expenses. We've got the, the income up top minus the adjustments to income, which are kind of like above the line deductions to get to that AGI. Then you take either the standard deduction, which would typically be easier and normally applies to uh, most you know taxpayers unless your income is over a certain threshold also remember that you might say well what's going to be the factor that basically triggers people to itemize it's usually something like a home when they purchase a home that's one of the biggest deductions because you're going to be financing a lot of it and oftentimes the mortgage interest is going to be deductible as well as the property taxes and that's huge deduction that pushes a lot of people over to itemizing but be careful when you're purchasing a home that if someone's if they're arguing that you should purchase the home just to get the deductions of the mortgage interest you got to be careful on that because the benefit that you're getting isn't really the full deduction of the itemized deduction because you would have got the standard deduction anyways the the real benefit you're getting is the difference between how much standard deduction you would have gotten and how much more benefit you got on the itemized deduction so once again for for a lot of people it might not be as big a difference as you would think for more wealthy people that might have two houses or something like that and have you know a lot you know larger house and, and therefore larger financing then it's more likely again to be a, a bigger significant thing uh to be to be itemizing and so on so in any case that's going to be the taxable income so then we're gonna apply the tax rates you can think about it or in essence the tax table this is where we're going to actually apply the calculation of the tax this is something that we as tax preparers aren't usually doing by hand we looked about we looked at this in the past because we would have to apply the progressive tax system meaning the different rate tables and so on which and if you were to do this with the tables with the actual tables in the instructions for the 1040 you would look up the tables that's how the software will typically calculate it and so so again we really rely on the software for this so in other words Normally, we can double check this number up top, possibly with an Excel worksheet, as, as we will do. We'll double check these numbers, then we'll rely oftentimes on the tax software to do the actual calculation because it's a progressive tax. It's complicated to figure out that rate because you got to look it up in a table, number one and number two. It's not just a table because you might have more detail than that. You might have to break out the capital gains rates, which could be different, as well as the um, <clears throat> the dividends rates could be different. 
So once, you, once you've got the tax rate, that'll give you the, the tax before credits and other taxes. So you would think this would be the bottom line of what you owe, but no, you also have the credits that are gonna, that are gonna take place. The confusing component about the credits is they kind of combine the credits together with the payments in the tax formula because the credits are equivalent in value to basically something that you paid in to, to the system. So you gotta be careful when you're thinking about a deduction versus a credit. When you're thinking about a deduction, it, if you're talking about $1 of a deduction or $1 of a credit, the credit will be worth more than the deduction. So in other words, if you had a deduction, you gotta think, do I even get the deduction? Because if it's an itemized deduction, it's not gonna help me if I'm standardizing. So first of all, if I, am I gonna get the deduction? If it's gonna give you a benefit on the deduction side of things, say it's, a, say it's an adjustment from uh, adjustment, it's an adjusted gross income deduction or an adjustment to income deduction, then you're only gonna get a benefit based on basically the rate that it's gonna be applied to that dollar of, of the deduction. So you're only gonna get a portion of the benefit of that deduction, whereas if it's a credit, you're gonna get that full dollar worth of a credit. So a dollar for dollar deduction, deduction versus a credit, the credit is gonna be worth more than uh, the deduction. That's gonna be the general rule that, uh, that you wanna keep in, in mind. So then we're gonna say subtract or add the tax credit and other taxes. So the credits are gonna be things, once we're down here, we're, we're now looking at the tax. This is basically what our liability would be if we had not already paid into the system, which we have because the IRS wants to get paid as we go. For most people, they get paid by your employer taking money out of your W-2 and paying it to the IRS on your behalf. Uh, but then we also have the credits that are going to subtract. We're going to reduce the liability, what you liability would be for the taxes minus the credits. So that's good because that would make your liability go down. But we could also have other taxes that could be involved down here that we're going to apply that are not the income taxes. One of the biggest examples often being self-employment tax. So, for example, if you work and you have a Schedule C business, then uh, you, you have to, you, if, you were, if you're a W-2 employee, you have to pay Social Security and Medicare and the income tax through payroll taxes. If you're a sole proprietorship, then you're not paying the payroll taxes for your income that you're earning. The IRS wants that money. So they're going to include it in self-employment tax is one of the big taxes for many people that people often it hits people unaware of, uh, of how that's gonna happen because they're so used to being an employee. When they move to self-employed, they're calculating just on the federal income tax and forgetting about the social security and Medicare, which in essence are the payroll taxes that are now being applied to them as a sole proprietorship in the form of self-employment taxes. So those are gonna be added, that could be added down here depending on the type of business. If you're a W-2 employee, then you've already paid those taxes because the employer took them out of your wages because they were forced to by the government. And so they took them out and you paid them already typically. So that's gonna give us then the, what we'll call the total tax here. So we had the tax before, uh, we had the tax before credits and other taxes, and then we applied out the credits and the other taxes. So now we're said the total tax, which would be your liability if you had not already paid in to the system. but you have paid into the system because you uh, because they, that's what the government wants, right? They want you to be paying into the system as the year goes. So if we're talking about tax year 2021, the government wants to be paid in 2021, even though you don't file the tax return until April 15th of 2022 or somewhere thereabouts, possibly April 18th of 2022. So they want the money during the, the time frame now. If the way the tax system was kind of designed, it would work something like this. In a perfect world, what would happen is that you earn revenue and you pay the government their share of the revenue as you earn it throughout 2021. When you file the tax return by April 18th or 15th or whatever of uh, the next year, 2022, it should just be an information return. In a perfect world, in other words, you would have the total tax liability that you recalculated, and then you would tell the government, and I already paid it throughout the year, possibly through withholdings from my W-2 wages, and therefore you would have no refund and no tax due. That's how it's kind of designed to do. However, that's impossible to do due to the complexity of the tax code. In other words, it's impossible 
for us to pay the exact amount of tax that we owe because we have a progressive tax system with multiple tiers, because we have you know multiple people that could be combined on one return, because we've got credits that are gonna distort the whole thing as well. So it's way too complicated for us to ever get the exact tax calculated. So that means that what we try to do is shoot for the refund. That's why you have a refund. And, and you can see this in the payroll taxes. If you've ever dealt with payroll taxes, it uses more of a flat tax and you file the 941s quarterly. And normally if you do things properly because it's a more simple tax, it's, it's, it's using the same system on a quarterly basis. But when you actually file the tax return, you're not paying any more tax at that point in time. You're just saying, hey, look, this is how much tax I owe based on the calculation. I already paid you it when I processed the payroll. There's no tax, there's no, there's no refund at that point in time. That's kind of how the, the, the income tax was designed to be, but it's way too complex to do that because we don't have a flat tax and because the income's confusing because the deductions are, you know, get out of control and the credits are a mess and so on. So what we do then is we try to say, I'm gonna shoot to overpay the taxes. So when you look at your tables for the W-2 withholding tables and so on, they're designed to overshoot the taxes. If so if you calculate it properly based on, you know, the directions for the, for the filling out your W-4 in order for the withholdings to be taken out of your W-2, they're designed to overshoot so that you pay too much. And that, and that's what you're getting in terms of the refund in normal cases. So now you got the tax payments which hopefully you paid a little too much in that case to get a refund. Why do they try to overshoot it instead of undershoot it? Is it so that you can get a nice surprise of a refund? That's not, that's, you know, that might be part of it, for, from, but really what you're trying to do on your side of things is you're trying to avoid paying penalties and interest. This, you know, how does the IRS kind of enforce this whole system? They have a stick. They got this stick that they hit people with. It's called penalties and interest. So if you underpay the tax, they're gonna hit you with the stick of penalties and interest. We're trying to, we don't want it, I don't like getting hit with the stick. So what you're trying to do is overpay a little bit so that you can avoid the penalties and interest because you can't exactly hit exactly what the what the amount of tax you're gonna owe is. So that means that, that you've got the tax payments down here and then the refundable credits. We'll talk more about refundable credits. They've become more and more significant. Those are things like the child tax credit, which has an advanced portion to it now. And you've got the earned income credit, which are the two big refundable credits and possibly the recovery rebate credit tied to the, to the economic stimulus payments. So those, those are also gonna be down here. Refundable means that we could go below the, the tax. So we could not only not owe any tax uh, and not just get a refund back because we overpaid the tax, but actually get money. So in that case, if you were using the refundable portion of a refundable credit, you would be getting getting money. You know, it's not like you would be paying tax in that case. You would be receiving money through the tax code while filing your tax return. And it wouldn't really be a refund in that case, even though it's still kind of kind of called a refund, it would be, you know, a benefit kind of program. So those are that's why they're down here in the refundable credits section. So we'll talk more about those later. And then finally, we get to the tax refund or the tax due at the bottom line. So this is basically mirroring the, the, the actual 1040. Every line item on here, we can then supplement with another schedule that might help us to give us more detail. So for example, the income line item might be supplemented with a Schedule C, a Schedule E that helps break down more of that information. The adjustments might be on a Schedule 1 to tell us what actual those adjustments are. The itemized deductions is gonna be on a Schedule A that breaks down the actual itemized deductions. So you can think about it, if you were thinking about an Excel worksheet format, you'd say, okay, this is the first sheet, which is the summary sheet, summary formula. And then I'm gonna break down each of these line items with a separate sheet that feeds into that first line item. When you're envisioning it in your mind, then if someone asks you a question and you're saying, okay, you got a schedule C thing, that's gonna ultimately feed into the first line item of the income statement and will have an ultimate impact on taxable income of this and so on. That's how you kind of want to visualize it. Oh, you have something that's an adjustment to income that which would fall in here, which you would have a deduction to the adjusted gross income, which could have an inf impact on your phase outs and so on for other credits and whatnot. 
oh, you have something that's an itemized deduction that would be kind of here, that would be going on your schedule A, it would flow into this portion on the first page of your formula. That's how you want to start to visualize in your mind what's going to happen. And then, and then you want to solidify that by doing practice problems with the use of, say, Excel worksheets and, of course, with the use of software.